Welcome back to Steve's Vintage Mono Builds, and very welcome. Uh, thanks to all my subscribers, returning viewers, and new viewers. I appreciate you taking time to to look at some of my videos. A uh, little interesting one today. Uh, it's been raining here. It rained real hard all night last night. And so to avoid being depressed, I, I went over to my local hobby shop, NRC Hobbies. And uh, hunting around in the bargain bin, as usual. And I'd seen this before, but I, I had kind of uh, uh, wasn't that interested in it. But I was looking at it again today, and uh, it's $9.99 in the bargain bin. And original price on here is $24.95. This kit's uh, from 1996. So if this was $24.95 in 1996, I sure want to know what we're getting inside. So I spent the money. Got the kit. It's still in its original cellophane. Uh, unlike the uh, the Mania Hobby uh, Nakashima B5N1 Kate kit, um, I won't. I won't regret opening this one up. I, I'm really starting to think I should have left the the Kate in its original cellophane. Um, but again, I'm not a collector, so. Somebody comes along and wants to offer me a whole bunch of money for it without the cellophane, fine. Uh, but really, it's uh, it's a lovely kit, and I'm going to wait a while until I I can uh, improve my skills significantly before I attack it. It's a fairly simple kit and everything, but I really do want to do it justice because it really is. It's a beautiful kit, and you can see. Um, you can see the review video and uh, and uh, make up your own mind. So, uh, Mania is long gone now. Uh, they were they were bought out by Hasegawa, and but I think Hasegawa still uh, markets kits from some of their molds, some of the old molds. In any case, uh, on to the subject of today. So we've got the Fairchild M62 slash PT19A, 172 scale. And this is from a company called MPM. Uh, they're based in, in uh, well, at the time was, uh, what do they call it? They call it the Czech Republic. Yeah, in the Czech Republic. They're still in the Czech Republic. Or Chetsia, as it's called now, and uh, and then yeah, they they uh, they're they're still in business. So anyway, so uh, yeah, it's uh, MPM catalog number seven two zero six three. Got uh, original human created uh, painted artwork here on the front not much other information the sides the same same picture and here we've got the notes about you know instructions in different languages and decal set and all that kind of stuff uh, it is in the original cellophane or the, the original plastic wrap and as happens with many of these kits, um, you'll, you'll see that uh, the box is kind of collapsed in. Now, that's not because it's been crushed, but it's because of the technology back then for shrink wrapping. Um, uh, they, they would shrink wrap and, and, uh, and it, would, it would cause the box to f see it with a lot with matchbox, old matchbox kits as well. So it doesn't seem to matter, uh, you know, how well you... How well you take care of them uh, that seems to be the case so all right let's uh, let's crack on as uh, my friend the Yorkshireman says 
get into it. It's going to be too much glare. All right, in the dark we are. And so you know what's coming now. Here comes the history. Uh, there will not be a quiz at the end of the video. So the Fairchild PT-19, uh, Fairchild designation M62, was an American monoplane primary trainer aircraft, served in the United States Air Force, the RAF, and the Royal Canadian Air Force during World War II. Uh, designed by Fairchild Aircraft, I'll have more on that in a minute, it was a contemporary of the cadet biplane trainer and was used by the United States Army Air Force during primary flying training. As with other USAAF trainers of the period, the PT-19 had multiple designations based on the power plant installed. <coughs> Excuse me. So the PT-19 series was developed from the Fairchild M62 uh, when the US uh, Army Air Corps first ordered the aircraft in 1940 as part of its expansion program. The cantilever low-wing monoplane with fixed landing gear and tailwheel design was based on a two-place tandem seat, that's one in front of the other, open cockpit arrangement. The simple but rugged construction included a fabric-covered, well-welded steel tube fuselage. The remainder of the aircraft was plywood construction with a plywood sheath, sheath center section, outer wing panels, and tail assembly. The use of an inline engine allowed for a narrow frontal area, which was ideal for visibility, while the widely set apart fixed landing gear allowed for solid and stable ground handling. In other words, it could take a beating when the winds, when student flyers banged it down uh, badly. So. Uh, it was manufactured by the Fairchild Corporation. Uh, some modelers, especially older ones, uh, might, might be aware of the Fairchild Corporation, it was founded by Sherman Fairchild, an American, in 1924 as the Fairchild Aviation Corporation, uh, based in Farmingdale and East Farmingdale, New York. Uh, golfers will know that for the uh, Farmingdale is the, uh, the location of the, the Beth Page uh, golf complex, public golf complex. And Fairchild uh, produced the first U.S. aircraft to include a fully enclosed cockpit and hydraulic landing gear. It was the Fairchild FC-1. Uh, they also operated in Longueuil, Quebec uh, as an aircraft manufacturer from 1920 to 1950. And uh, that was a subsidiary of the Fairchild Company of the United States. Uh, Fairchild, uh, for quite a number of years, uh, they were prominent in the in the aircraft industry, and uh, obviously a, a U.S. military contractor. And um, so, uh, as with you know, a lot of uh, um, you know, there was a lot of consolidation and buying this and buying that, this company would own this company, and so on and so forth. Uh, Fairchild was probably best known as most famous. Um, uh, most famous aircraft is the A-10 Thunderbolt. Uh, that was a Fairchild uh, Corporation. And uh, they started developing that in uh, 1971 at their Germantown, Maryland plant. And it prevailed over the Northrop YA-9 in the ADAX competition, competition and produced originally 716 aircraft. 
They also developed the T-46 jet trainer to replace the Cessna T-37, uh, but it wasn't uh, accepted by the Air Force because of performance problems. They were associated with Boeing for a number of years, and in 1996, they, uh, uh, they took over the assets of the Dornier Corporation, a very famous uh, aircraft manufacturer uh, uh, in Germany from the Second World War. In 1999, uh, the uh, corporation was acquired by German insurer Allianz AG, so what goes around comes around. And uh, the United States Investment Group of Clayton, Dubillier du du and Rice uh, for $1.2 billion. And in 2003, the assets of Fairchild were purchased by M7 Aerospace and the new company was moved to San Antonio, New Mexico. Then, in its last iteration, uh, in December 2010, M7 was purchased by the United States subsidiary of the Israeli defense contractor, Elbit Systems. M7 Aerospace does not manufacture aircraft, but focuses on aerospace parts and support services. So, uh, a long and convoluted history. Let's, uh, let's take a look inside. Okay, so let's take a look here. Wow. This is open, open cockpit, cockpit, so there's no, uh, no clear plastic parts. And we get one sprue. I'm sure glad I didn't pay $24.95 for this at any time. I'm not too impressed that I paid $9.99. But we'll see. We'll take a look here and see. All right. So, uh, plastic well sealed. This might have been bashed because there was there's some blistering there. Decal set is in its own yeah, the decal set is in its own plastic bag and I'm looking at the back here we have some photo etch uh -huh. that might that might push me up to the nine ninety nine but certainly uh, not twenty four ninety nine. Uh, the date on the decals here is 1995, and they look old. Uh, they are showing their age, but hopefully, hopefully they'll go on. They'll work. Not a bad little decal set though for such a little little kit. Now, here, there is a clear plastic piece. And it's, it's like the kind of plastic you get, like it's, it's not, not, not the regular clear plastic you get um, for canopies and so forth. Uh, it's, it's more like the, the kind of pressed stuff that they, uh, uh, the form stuff where they, you know, like you, you know, the thing would fit in there in the package. 
and also it's all all blistered and gnarly. So, uh, hmm. not worth much. Okay, we'll take a look at the single sprue here. Uh, not a complicated kit at all. Um, quality of the plastic is okay. Um, I'm actually feeling a lot of roughness. And there's some blemishing here. Uh, the roughness, that might come off when we do the soak. Uh, this looks maybe like a, a 30 minute build. And, uh, you know, maybe another hour on paint scheme. And the other thing that's disappointing is there are no figures. It's a two-seater. Uh, they show figures uh, in the illustration, but there are no figures, so that's very disappointing. Uh, very basic, basic kit, a uh, fair bit of flash on the wheels here. Uh, flash here. Bit of molding on the cockpit uh, control panels, but really very little, very little detail. All right, here we go. We got the the instruction booklet, uh, black and white drawing, side view. And their history notes, well, that's good. They've got history notes. You know, it's not twenty four ninety five worth of history notes, or nine ninety nine even, but they've got history notes. And their notes say, before the outbreak of World War II, the U.S. military services, excuse me, announced their interest in a new training aircraft. The Fairchild had already begun to design a new monoplane suitable for Army requirements, as well as for civilian flying schools. Designated as the Model 62 by Armand J. T. Blot, it featured an unconventional wing which aimed to help student pilots avoid stall or spin accidents. The first test flight was made in 1938, and a year later, following an Air Corps contest, the Fairchild was awarded a contract by the U.S. Army. Designated the PT-19, the Fairchild trainers entered service in 1940, with hundreds being manufactured both in the USA and under license in Canada, again at the Longueuil, Quebec. Uh, manufacturing plant. By, 19, by 1944, more World War II pilots had received their initial flight instruction in the PT-19 than any other aircraft. Uh, as we can see, it's a very, very basic construction, not complicated, easy to fly, easy to land, exactly what you want in a trainer. Okay, and so we, we open up the instructions here. get the sprue map, the photo etch, and uh, yeah, it actually says to cut cut the, uh, the windscreens out with scissors. Seriously guys? Okay, so we've got that, then it gives you the, the paints. Uh, they tell you the Humbrol paint, uh, they use the Humbrol paint scheme, give you the little legend. Paint scheme on the back of the insert here, not in color, all black and white. Uh, for rivet counters, and anybody who really wants to uh, 
go into great detail about uh, some basic aircraft design. Uh, there's there's a, a nice diagram here that lists everything. Trim tabs, where the throttle was located, trim control, what was covered with metal, rudder control, push rods, all the rods, everything. Yeah, so uh, that's really cool. I have to do something good for $24.95. Yikes. I wouldn't, I'd be upset if I paid $24.95 for this today, let alone in 1996. But anyways, I was curious and now my curiosity has been uh, uh, sated. Um, so yeah, but you do get the photo etch, uh, which was actually pretty good for back in 96. And that was probably what helped them to justify the, uh, the price. So again, as with most aircraft uh, assemblies, start with the cockpit, it's very basic. Um, you know, there's, there's some control levers, da 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 da. Assembling the fuselage, the landing gear, uh, accessories and ancillary parts. And that's it. All right, so the moment of truth. Uh, so first of all, um, you know, there was no mailing or shipping packaging. Um, it was sealed and I'm gonna do my best here, okay? <laughs> It was sealed with plastic and the seal was unbroken, but the box itself had been not just from the shrink wrap seal, but it had been bashed up a little bit. So quarter point off for that. Inside, there were no bent or broken parts. Nothing's broken off the sprues. Uh, it's fairly thick plastic. Um, and it has rough spots as well as some blemishes. Uh, blemishes I don't care too much about because they get mostly painted over if you're going to do that. Um, decals are old but they look good and they're in their own... Uh, They're, they're in their own plastic bag. Lots of flash um, and not great detail. So that'll be a 1.5. Then for the parts, uh, I guess a 2.75, I can't take too much off because nothing was broken off or whatever. Uh, and the instructions are nice, they're straightforward, they're simple. Um, I give them credit for the, 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 the draftsman and it's always nice when you get a, when you get a sprue map or inventory. Quarter point off, no color. Although the box art's nice. Okay. Um, I usually don't. Well, let's put it this way. Uh, back in 1996, Uh, I think the, the only person who would pay uh, $24.95 for this kit uh, would be uh, 
father uh, running around at the last minute trying to grab some sort of some sort of uh, birthday gift for their kid. But it is what it is, and I guess NPM is doing something right because they're still in business. <coughs> but all in all, uh, without breaking it down too much, uh, I'm gonna have to give it a. Uh, I think the best I can do here is about a six and a half. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Uh, like I said, nice that they have this here, but what? So what, right? I mean, you can get that off the original stuff. Anyways, so, um, like I said, it is what it is. And, I mean, seriously, 1996 and you get this? I mean, I wish I could really show you the... Yeah, it, it, yeah, it, I mean, it, it looks like shriveled plastic wrap, really. Come on, really, come on, guys. So, yeah, that's the best I can do with that. And so uh, this will probably be, it'll probably sit on the shelf for quite a while. And if, I, when I, if and when I do decide to do anything with it, uh, it'll probably be just an afternoon where I, I, ju I just want to do something kind of mindless. You know, you ever have days like that where you just want to, you don't want anything hard, you don't want to have anything, you know, you're going to have to fiddle with too much. You just want to work your hands and, and putter around a little bit. So... So that's that. I think it's the lowest rating I've given. I think you guys know I'm always really fair. I try to be. Um, but even at even at nine ninety nine, uh, this is a disappointment. So except the box art, the box art is nice, very nice picture, hand painted. So. Okay, so, uh, sorry to say, but that's the way it is. All right, so, uh, trying to keep everything under 30 minutes these days. So, uh, that's it for today. I'm still working on trying to come up with the live stream. This might not be published before that, uh, but I'll just keep it in the pocket. But I had a bit of time today. And I was curious to see what was inside for... What well, was twenty four ninety five in nineteen ninety six? All right, so thanks again. Thanks again to all my subscribers. We're pushing seventy five now, and um, I really appreciate uh, everyone's uh, everyone subscribing. Uh, I hope you'll like the videos, leave comments, and uh, hopefully see you uh, at the live stream. So thanks again. Have a great day, everyone.